Hey, online church, Pastor Ed Newton coming from our main campus here in San Antonio, Texas, and we are CBC in CBC or we. CBC stands for Community Bible Church, and we're a church that desires to push people to serve God with all of their heart and to do it within community. This message series has been called The Voice. That is, this message series has allowed us to understand that God wants to speak to us. He still speaks to us, but could we tune our ears to hear what he has to say? Today's message called A Clarifying Voice. It is as we seek to understand how God speaks, specifically through circumstances. How do we quantify and how do we qualify? That is, we'll talk about the message and the word kairos. That is the God moment, the divine moment, where God begins to press into us and leads us to a response where we're called to repent and believe. And as we choose to follow him, the trajectory of our life simply is surrendered and submissive to his direction in our life, thus allowing us to walk in the supernatural as if it's the natural. So be encouraged today. Know that you have been called to greater things and may this message inspire you. Till we meet again, much love. It's truly been breathtaking to watch what God has done all week and long in our house. And we have been walking through this series for the past several weeks called The Voice. Now let me just explain to you where this conversation actually originated from. My wife and I, her name's Stephanie. We have four children. We have a 15-year-old, a 14-year-old, soon to be 13-year-old, and soon to be 11-year-old. That's an introductory statement and a prayer request all at the same time. I mean, my, my prayer life is right on point. When you're allowing your 15-year-old to drive you to church in Jesus' name, you're like, God, take, just take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel right now. Take the wheel. But I've also discovered when you put that student driver sticker on the back, folks are a little bit more patient with you. I'm thinking about driving around with a student driver. That is, to have that magnet on the back of the vehicle was truly a moment where I felt like for the first time in living in San Antonio, nobody honked at you. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we're, we're an expressive city. We like to let folks know you've said at that light two seconds too long, and in Jesus' name, we're going to let you know by honking at you. Anybody else? There's nothing worse when you get honked at by somebody that's got a CBC sticker on it. They're like, hey, God bless you too. Thank you for being a part of our church. We're not a perfect church. We just serve a perfect God. We're asking this perfect God to help us drive a little better, right? So, but I am so thankful that you're here today. But this conversation while driving with my daughter, Lola, I just, as a dad, just said, Lola, what's God saying to you? You ever ask that question to your kids? What's God saying to you? And my 14-year-old daughter looked at me and she said, dad, I don't know. She goes, I'm a Christian, but I, I don't know how to hear God's voice. And there was that moment for me that honestly, it was a moment of enlightenment. I went, here's my daughter, follower of Jesus, that would just say, hey, I go to CBC and the pastor is my dad, but I don't hear the voice of God. And she said this, and this really is an echo of a lot of people that are saying the same thing, but I'd like to know how to hear God's voice. I got permission to share that story. I said, Lola, I'll leave your name out of it. She goes, no. She goes, tell the church my name. And I had folks walk up to me going, hey, I can relate with Lola. And honestly, I could relate with Lola. Because there's a lot of days I go, God, could you speak? But God speaks in various ways. He speaks through his word, through his spirit, through circumstances. And for us to recognize God's activity, we got to be able to filter it, see it, and respond to it. And what I want to do today Thus, the four props that are on stage is to somehow be able to quantify and qualify what we're calling a kairos moment. Now, the word kairos is the Greek word for time. Now, there's two words for time in the New Testament. There is what's called chronos, which is where we get the word chronological. That's seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. And then there's what's called kairos. Kairos is the God moment. For example, Kairos is an archery term where the individual that is releasing the arrow would pull to a level of tension, the bow, and then releasing the arrow at the right moment. For those of you that are wearing ties today, there is what's called a window of opportunity where you put the tie into that hole that allows everything to come together. So God's will is about timing and opportunity, but timing and opportunity have to come together. It may be the right time, but you don't have opportunity. You could have opportunity, but it's the wrong time. 
But when the right time and the right opportunity come together, that is a doorway into your destiny. And as we think about understanding the voice of God, I want to share with you today from God's word in Exodus chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and meet with me at Exodus chapter 3. We're going to look at a few verses today. But as you're turning there, realizing that you're multi-talented and able to multitask all at the same time. The four object lessons on the stage I want to introduce to you. There is the speed bump. You may not be able to see this, but it's been clearly marked as a speed bump. We have the brick wall. We have the mirror. And then we have the window. That is, if we could quantify the Kairos moment, that is the God moment, as a speed bump, brick wall, window, or mirror, it allows us to be able to recognize God's work in our life. Now, there's a guy by the name of Henry Blackaby. For those of you that have been around church for a while, he wrote a book called Experiencing God. That is, top five most sold books within Lifeway, Christian Resources, Experiencing God. He revealed to us this idea that God is at work around us daily and often. And the question is, do we see him at work and do we have the courage to join him there? Now, when we talk about this Kairos moment, it's God at work. But how does he reveal himself to us and how do we respond? The Kairos moment, I want to draw your attention to the listener guide. A simple definition in regards to Kairos would be this. It is a divine moment. And that's the fill in the blank. That is the word catalyst. The word catalyst. Now, for those of you much like me hooked on phonics, we put this word on the screen to help you be able to phonetically write this out on your page. It's a catalyst moment. That is, it propels you into God activity. It's distinctly different from what's called chronos. Chronos would be a dated moment or a counted moment. But I want to show you this image as you're filling in those blanks, catalyst moment or a counted moment. I want you to turn your eyes to the screen. I want you to look at this clock. That is chronos, seconds, minutes, hours. But do you see the parentheses? That God in the rhythm of your life wants to create a space where God does something significant and that significant moment is a kairos moment. It doesn't just happen one time a day. It happens multiple times a day. And my prayer for all of us, for my daughter Lola and for the church that I dearly love, that we would be able to recognize those Kairos moments and we could define them, that we could actually say that was a speed bump moment. And I'll explain in just a few moments what that is. Or that is a brick wall moment or a mirror moment or a window moment. We got to use this vocabulary and our vernacular when God speaks. It's a Kairos moment. So on the count of three, can we say the word Kairos? One, two, three. Kairos. Now, when we ask the question, what was your Kairos moment? It could be quantified or qualified as speed bump, brick wall, mirror, or window. But I want to show you how we can begin to work through that. But I want to use the example of Exodus chapter 3. So if you're with me, 1145 service, come on, say amen. Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now pay attention to verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Point number 1, writing this down. As we articulate and quantify what a Kairos moment is, that God moment, speed bump, is our first application. It's the speed bump of experience. So point number one, it's a deciphering moment. A deciphering moment. What do I mean by deciphering? When you come across a speed bump, here's the, here's the motion here, you feel it. For Moses, he was shepherding in the wilderness. For 40 years, he grew up in the home of Pharaoh's daughter, but when he killed a man, that's right, killed a man and buried him in the sand and became Egypt's most wanted, and it was like a familiar episode from Cops, he fled, and the way that you hide from Egyptians is you become a shepherd because Egyptians despise shepherds, and for 40 years in the rhythm and the routine of shepherding, all of a sudden there was a burning bush. All of us want a burning bush moment, do we not? But only Moses got that burning bush moment. But if we could understand God gives us burning bush moments, they just look a little bit different. 
But the speed bump moment for Moses was the fact that he saw a bush on fire. Was that the first time that he'd seen a bush on fire? Absolutely not. But what drew his attention? What caused him to be inclined to the burning bush? It was not what? Consumed. So all of a sudden the Bible would say this, that he looked and noticed. I put this in the notes. It was an unusual event or a unique encounter. Pastor Hutch Kufal and his wife Megan have four children. They are on our faith team here that is serving in our adult discipleship dimension and department. Hutch Kufal and I have been friends for a long time. But he was serving at a church called First Baptist Church, Bentonville, Arkansas. And I felt led and compelled to call him and ask him to be a part of our team. I had no idea that these events were actually happening behind the scenes. They were on a mission trip in Ecuador. He and his wife. Hutch and Megan, they were just at the 10 o'clock service, sitting on the front row here. They were in Ecuador and not knowing that I was about to call and ask them to consider about being on our pastoral team, that they were in Ecuador and would later tell me this story that while they were in Ecuador riding a bus, they saw a sign that said San Antonio that way. (laughs) Now, it wasn't pointing to San Antonio, Texas, but there was a town in Ecuador called San Antonio. They chalked that up as, if you will, just a speed bump moment. Literally, Megan Kufal would nudge her husband and go, look, and he would think, it's just coincidence. Until they got to Atlanta, Georgia, we're going through customs, and I officially made the phone call and said, Hutch, I would like for you to consider being a part of our team. It was at that moment he would say to me, Ed, this is crazy, saw the San Antonio sign. Second of all, he would say this, I'm in customs. Check this out, 1145. He goes, I'm in customs. He goes, there's a young man in front of me with a backpack on that says CBC. It's got a CBC patch on the backpack. He asked me this question. He goes, do y'all sell patches in the bookstore? I go, no. We don't sell patches. We haven't made a patch. That'd be a great idea to have a patch, but we got bumper stickers. And he goes, then what is God trying to say? I'm like, To come to CBC. (laughs) And now they've been faithfully serving on our team. But they would say what started off as a speed bump moment turned into a brick wall. Here's the reason why. Megan Kufal knew that God was saying something. But sometimes as men, we're a little bit slower to the party. And he began to downplay it until that CBC sticker standing in front of him. God saying, I'm talking But sometimes we chalk that up as just coincidence or circumstance, but that's called a speed bump moment. That would be that deciphering moment. So if we could live our life and not just relegate and delegate everything to it just happened. See, for example, the Holy Spirit of God is leading us and guiding us and nudging us. And if you're watching The Manifest, which is a TV series that my wife and I are watching faithfully, it's called The Calling. So that Holy Spirit that's in us that we just sang about is leading us and prompting us and nudging us and speaking to us. And one of the ways that the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us is not only through his word, but what we would consider as random moments. But if we can open our eyes and open our heart and not just dismiss it, but instead recognize it and decipher it. That's why I point, come on, folks, I'm preaching today. I'm decipher it, then we can understand, oh, God, you care enough about me to put a young man with a CBC patch on his backpack at the moment I was going through customs, and God does this. You got to look at me, and God does this right here. Just got you. I got you. Point number two, write this down. Not only does God give us what we would call the speed bump moment, deciphering moments, but point number two, there's a detouring moment. A detouring moment. Now, when we talk about this, we're referring to the brick wall. Detouring moment. What was the detouring moment for Moses? It wasn't just the burning bush. It was the fact that the burning bush began to speak. Verse 4, Exodus 3, Moses, Moses. Verse 5, the Bible would say this, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. Then in verse 6, I am the God of the fa- your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then in verse 9, God would say this to Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver the nation of Israel from captivity, for I hear the cries of my people. So I put this in the notes. That brick wall moment that changes your trajectory, that causes you to go in a different direction, is a personal calling. 
Not only a personal calling, but a place of conviction. Your heart, your heart all of a sudden is captivated by what God is doing. And not only that, but also it leads to a point of connection. That God goes, I've already been working behind the scenes. The moment that God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, immediately Moses was like, I could trust you. I could trust you. And then there was a moment of compassion. He felt led when he heard that there were people enslaved. His heart was bent in that direction. Now let me see if I could practically illustrate this. We just finished up 21 days of prayer and fasting. That is every prayer request that we have kept the past 21 days is hanging on what we call the rope of hope. We're going to leave that up. Is it okay if we leave that up there for a while? I'm just telling you. We just believe that these prayers are seed for revival in our church. And as we, for 21 days, chose to give up something for something greater, for 21 days I made a decision to just eat fruits and vegetables for 21 days. Crazy confession. At Christmas, I ate every possible form and fashion of junk food (laughs) and lost weight. Ate fruits and vegetables only for 21 days and gained weight. God said, Ed, your body's made for junk food. And I said, yes and amen. Yes and amen. I received that Holy Spirit. But a part of that fast for me specifically was walking away for a season from the greatest drink ever introduced to human history, and that would be called Diet Dr. Pepper. (laughs) So last Sunday evening, I was playing basketball. Our time went a little bit late. It got near midnight, and for many of you, you remember, the question was asked, when does the fast officially end? I said, 12.01. So on my way home, in Jesus' name, I saw a Whataburger. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I Pulled into the water burger, and I at 12:01 was going to get some Diet Dr Pepper. And if you don't believe me, turn your eyes to the screen. Check this out. I'm a man of my word. Now understand this: I'm riding alone. I walk into Water Burger, 281 in Evans. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I didn't realize that there's so many people that hang out at a Whataburger at midnight. It must have been all CBC people doing the same thing I was doing. 1201, double cheeseburger. But it was at that moment that I needed a picture. Here's what I need you to understand. I just needed a picture. I went in just to take a picture. But as I'm trying to find somebody to take this picture, there's a lot of folks in conversation, but there's one woman sitting by herself. She's trying to balance her checkbook. And there at that table, she's sitting Waiting, and I, in my social awkwardness, walk up and just go, hi, hi um, I know this sounds crazy, but could you take a picture of me drinking from that fountain machine? <laughs> she stands up. I take that picture. All of a sudden, she goes, and what is this for? <laughs> I go, as a church, we've been praying fasting for 21 days, and it's over. <laughs> it's over. She goes, did you say fasting? I said, yes, yes, ma'am. And I said, our church has been fasting. And she goes, well, me too. And I thought she went to CBC. I go, so what church do you go to? Hoping she would say CBC. She goes, no, I go, I go to another church down the road. And she goes, I've been praying and fasting every day till 1 a.m. Because I need a miracle. I said, what miracle are you in need of? She goes, the bank is about to foreclose on my house. And I'm just trying to figure out how to balance my checkbook. She goes, I'm a single mom. And I got three jobs. And I'm... I'm working for Uber Eats right now, waiting for the phone to ring. And so it's at that moment that she's going, I I deliver food, and I'm hoping somebody will order something for Whataburger, and I could deliver it. I'm just trying to have some side hustle and make some extra money. She goes, but my home's about to be foreclosed on, and I, I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, I want you to listen to me. It was at that moment she goes, so I've been fasting for several days, just needing a miracle till 1 a.m., and then all of a sudden she goes, what church do you go to? So she tells me that story. She goes, well, what church do you go to? I go, CBC. I, I didn't lead with, hi, my name's Ed Newton. I'm the pastor at CBC. <laughs> like I, I didn't lead that way. I, le- I mean, I just ball cap down low, basketball shorts. I smell like a middle school locker room. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and all of a sudden I go, I go to Community Bible Church. She looked at me. She kind of begins to like. She goes, Pastor Ed? (laughs) I go, yeah. 
tears. She goes, I went to the Easter service. I know who you are. She goes, I love your church. It was at that moment when she listened to me. Brick wall. Here's me, Whataburger. Want to take a goofy picture. Do-do, do-do, do-do. <laughs> and God's going, no, no, no. You think it's just you trying to be silly to post something on Instagram? I led you to meet this woman at the right time while she was balancing her checkbook. And I want you to listen to me. We as a church right now are helping this woman get out of the hole that she's in. But that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen unless we see it. And I want to be honest with you, and I want to illustrate this. There's a lot of moments I miss it. So don't think for a moment I'm like the bonic believer and I see all the Kairos moments, the brick wall moments, but I want to illustrate this and I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Those moments that you miss that brick wall moment, I'm so thankful that sometimes that brick wall starts moving towards you. And if you miss it, it'll go the other direction. That we got a God that just continues to go, well, I'll put it right here. Maybe he'll see it. Okay. No. Aren't you grateful that you got a God that just keeps going, I, I'll try. Kairos moment, brick wall. Point number three, write this down. Let me see if I can move this back for the folks on my right to be able to see this third option. That is the mirror for us is point number three. It's a discerning moment, not just a deciphering moment, a detouring moment, but a discerning moment. What, what do we do with that? That discerning moment leads us to the mirror, and that is the mirror of evaluation. For example, Moses, you'll see this in verses 10 and 11. When Moses hears God say, you're going to deliver the people of Israel out of bondage, you know what he says in that moment? He's like, who am I? It's a crisis of doubt. It's a crisis of belief. All of us in that moment where God says, I I'm speaking, I'm inviting, I want you to join me in my God activity. There's going to be a moment for many of us where our insufficiencies and our insecurities and our inadequacies begin to come to the surface. Moses goes, who am I? He later goes on to say, God, who are you? And then he says this, he goes, but what if they don't believe and then he goes, God, I can't even speak. I stutter when I talk. And God goes, who made your mouth? And then all of a sudden Moses goes, can you send somebody else? And he's like, nope, but I will give you Aaron. All that to say, if you ever felt inadequate, insufficient, I want you to know you're in good company. Because Moses felt that way. And there's many days I do. I'm my own worst enemy. But I want to share this with you. It was in 1999. I was in Troy, Alabama. I was invited to be a part of what's called a Disciple Now weekend. We call it one weekend. It's the first weekend of March for us here. But this event was 20 years ago. I was ordained to ministry in 1997. I've been faithfully serving in the ministry of God for 22 years. But in 1999, I was a college pastor at a church in Memphis. And a friend of mine in Troy, Alabama said, hey, could you help me out by working with 15 eighth grade boys? They need a Bible study leader. I said, yeah, love to. Brought a college kid with me. We hung out. The way that the Disciple Now, our one weekend event, they have a Friday night session, Saturday morning session, Saturday night session. And every time they have a main session, they break up into a small group. And I'm a small group Bible study leader. I thought I was going to work with teenagers my whole life. Being on a stage was not something that I sought out to do. But on that Saturday night, Chandler Matthews looked at me and he said, Ed, um, it's 15 minutes before the service, by the way. He goes, God told me you're supposed to speak tonight. I go, excuse me? He goes, you're supposed to speak tonight. And then he looked at me and he said, you'll be disobedient to God if you don't do this. <laughs> and walks off. And I'm like... So I'm sitting with those 15 eighth graders going, God, what do I do? And now it came time for me to speak. I stood up on a stage. I preached everything I knew from Genesis to Revelation, made up some stuff, and I was done in seven minutes. Done in seven minutes. Some of you are like, uh, could you go back to those days? All right. But it was at that moment, at that moment, I got in my 
pickup truck. It was an F-150 because if you love the Lord, you drive a Ford. Amen. And so it was <laughs> vinyl seat, five-speed windows. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Windows. God just said, Ed, I know you thought you were going to work with students your whole life, but I'm calling you to be an evangelist. I want you to be the guy that stands on stage. I'm like, whoa. Like, I'm in my pickup truck going, God, I, I, I didn't do well last night. Um, I preached for seven minutes and made up some stuff. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And not only that, but, but God, my parents are deaf, and I really don't know how to talk. And, oh, by the way, I failed the SAT and, and failed English 099 and had a 1.5 at midterms. And my wife graduated magna cum laude, but I graduated, thank the Lord, and I... <laughs> And little did I know, check this out, because that journey in 1999 led me to end up traveling across the country. Why is that a big deal to me personally? Here's the reason why. Because it would be a moment where somebody from this church would see me on YouTube and call me and go, hey, could you come speak at our men's conference? And that happened six years in a row. And then Pastor Robert and I developed a friendship and a brotherhood. And then the summer of 2015, right here on this row. My family comes to Saturday Night Church. We all sit on this row. And the reason why we sit here versus here or here or here or here or up there, we sit right here because God spoke to my heart in that seat. I breathe the prayer out loud. God, I know that you've called me to pastor a church one day, but I'd like to pastor a church like CBC. Like CBC. Not I want to pastor CBC. I want to pastor a church like CBC because guys like me start a church with like 26 people and 14 of them are your own family. <laughs> I, I never thought in a million years that God would allow me to pastor the 19th largest church in the United States of America. I, I just, I want you to listen to me. Never in a million years. And let me tell you why. Because I didn't think I was good enough. But I'm so grateful that whether or not God chooses to use you is not based upon your ability, but it's based upon your availability. And it's that moment where you recognize that God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Because if he calls you, his provision and power always meets you at the place where he called you. So there's no pressure. When I first came to San Antonio, the news came, tried to interview me. They go, are you nervous? Well, absolutely I'm nervous. But could you hear me? I said, I don't have the pressure on my shoulder. God does. He's the one that brought me here. And if he brought me here, he's going to sustain me here. And when you hear me say, I needed CBC more than CBC needed me, you've been used of God to awaken my heart to the fact that God will give you the desires of your heart. You are a gift to my family. But there was a window or excuse me, a mirror moment for me. I was just going, God... Not me. You want somebody else. And God goes, no, you. I'm picking you. And you got a God that looks at you and goes, I pick you, 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 you. And he says that to all of us. But oftentimes that Kairos moment is a mirror where we go, God, are you sure? And God, in a very creative way, helps you to be at ease even in the midst of your crisis of belief and your crisis of doubt. Come on, can we clap our hands to that? Would that be all right? But one last point, and we're done. Point number four, we write this down. There is a defining moment, a defining moment. Now, that defining moment, you'll see this in verse 12. You shall serve God on this mountain. But I highlighted verse 12 in your notes, when you have brought the people out of Egypt. Did you hear that? God gave success to Moses before he even started. When you've brought out the people of Egypt. If you're like me, you talk back to the Bible. I, I don't know if you ever tried that. Like, I talk back to the Bible. I'm like, when you brought out the people of Egypt, I'm like, God, you, you, you could have done that without anybody's help. I mean, you, you've got, you could have articulated the stars in the sky to spell out a message to Pharaoh, but instead you used a man. You used a man. You use women. You use young people. You use anybody that would just say, God, I'm in. But I want you to listen to me. This moment for Moses at the burning bush was a Kairos moment. 
that in essence first started as a speed bump, ended up as a brick wall, turned into a mirror that eventually turned into a window when he recognized, oh, this is more than just being submitted to the plan of God for my own life. God, you're going to use me to affect the lives of millions of people. It's the window. You allow me to see beyond me. Do you know that the giftings and the, and the qualities that God has deposited in you is not just for you, but it's for the betterment of your family, for the betterment of your school, for the betterment of your workplace, for the betterment of our city, for the betterment of our state, our country, our world, and to the furthest end of the nations. That God would use you to have ramifications. And it may not happen in your lifetime, but if we could seize the moment, see the moment, seize the moment, be shaped by the moment, we may not see the fruition of the miracle that we were hoping to see, but your kids 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 might your great 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 grandkids might that we would be faithful with today and know that if God allows us to see the fruition of his faithfulness and the miracle that he's called us to that would be the desire of my heart but I'll be faithful today in the chronos in the day today today and I will be shaped by these defining moments that allow me to recognize the window of enlightenment, that practical application in point number four, it's not supposed to say the the mirror of evaluation, it's supposed to say the window of enlightenment, that you, God, have opened up the window and showed me my life can actually be used of you to change the world. And God wants to use you to change the world. Now, Now don't look into the mirror and go, who am I? But if you do understand, God goes, I have called you. I'll sustain you. I'll provide for you. I'll create a pathway for you. And just because it doesn't add up financially, God goes, I am the God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I'm the God that calls the stars by name. And if I'm that God, I promise you, I'll lead you. And that's what God hears from Moses. Who am I? And God goes, I'm with you. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. God is with you in the journey. Here's the takeaway. Here's the reason why it's important that we write this down. Either our lives will be measured by regrets. Anybody else got regrets? Should have done that. Oh, I don't want us to be woulda, coulda, shoulda Christians. I don't want us to be measured by our regrets. I want us to be measured by our risks. The risks that we were willing to take for the glory of God. What would you do for God if you knew you couldn't fail? Think about that. What would you do for God if you knew you couldn't fail? I believe that we would stop thinking about what could be instead begin to live in what should be. And as we begin to walk that way, I close with this. I had the privilege of preaching a memorial service yesterday across the street for one of our dear church members. He died at the age of 96, 96 years old. Colonel J.P. Thomas. He served in World War II served in Vietnam. But as I began to read basically the biography of J.P. Thomas, I was captivated by this story that in essence, honestly, I don't say this often, there should be a movie made about this man. Listen to this. The regiment that he was placed in charge of was a group of African-American prisoners. This is World War II, by the way. When they began to revolt against the decision and worried that they were being placed in the army so they, they could be killed, Colonel... J. Thomas said this, I promise you that not a single one of you will die on this battlefield. Here's a white man who has just now been given as a regiment all African-American inmates. And guess what their mission was? To rescue people in a German sweatshop that were held at gunpoint by the Nazi empire that all of a sudden they would be used to release people from captivity. Here's the story. One of the missions along with the regiment freed an entire German factory that was utilizing Jewish prisoners as laborers. The question was asked to J.P. Thomas. I just heard this story last night because the family who's a part of our church said this. They go, Ed, there's a little bit more to the story that you don't know. That J.P. Thomas, Colonel Thomas was asked the question, how were these inmates so loyal to you? You know what he said? He goes, I didn't see them for their color. I saw them for the fact that they were men. 
And then he goes on to say this. And he said, I recognized in this mission that they could not read nor write. So while we were waiting, I would teach them how to read and write write and as they learned how to read and write they saw the fact that I was giving them value and they were willing to lay down their life for me and all of them made it home and I thought to myself I thought to myself could I live my life in seizing the moments because if you're like me the moment happens and you go I wish I'd have seized the moment I'm praying for you today that you'll see the moment, seize the moment, be shaped by the moment, in the moment, not after the moment. That we not look back with regrets, but instead in the moment we'll go, I will take a great risk for the glory of God because he has spoken and it doesn't make sense to my family. It doesn't make sense to my friends. It doesn't make sense to my coworkers, but God, you spoke. So I say, yes, I'll take off the floaties. I'll jump in the deep water and I will trust you that you're faithful. Come on church, can we clap our hands to that truth and to that promise? Let's stand together if you don't mind. Thank you so much for listening. Kairos moments. So God, I thank you for the church I dearly love. Oh, they're not just faces in a crowd, they're family. And God, we believe we're not an audience, we're an army. And you are our commanding officer. And so God, as you speak, we'll listen. But God, make it real clear so we can discern it. We can decipher it. We can detour from whatever we're doing to join you in it. And God, we pray. We say yes to you. But God, today, we believe that there are people in the room that need to say yes to you as personal Lord and Savior. And today we call on the name of the Lord. Thank you that this prayer changed my life when I was 15 years old. And today we pray that if somebody needs to receive you, they'll have the courage to do so. So with heads bowed, eyes closed. Today, if you want to receive Jesus, say this to him. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. Today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, giving your life to Jesus, I want you to know it's the greatest decision of your entire life. Don't you be ashamed of Jesus, for Jesus was not ashamed of you. And if you prayed to receive Jesus Christ, here's what I'm going to ask that you would do. Would you raise your hand as tall as you can so I could see you? Anybody in the house today to say, Pastor Ed, today I gave my life to Jesus. Just raise your hand right where you're at. We're clapping because we believe it's the greatest decision. Somebody needs to be high-fiving that hand. Somebody needs to be hugging that person. We want to say thank you for watching today's message. I know my heart was moved and touched by delivering this message, and I hope today you received it. We'd love to hear from you personally. You can email us at nextsteps at communitybible.com or visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. Here's the reason why it's important that you send that message. Every story is a story we're celebrating and we're a church that initiates and celebrates life change in Jesus' name. And we wanna celebrate your story. So send that email, let us know what God's done in your heart, how he spoke to your heart and we'll celebrate over you and continue to pray with you. And if you're in the area, it's our encouragement to be a part of one of our gatherings. We'd love to have you a part of this house. But if you're outside the area, outside the region, maybe in another state, maybe in another country, know this, it's our encouragement to you for you to be involved in community where you could simply leverage all of your gifting for the purpose, for the fame, and for the glory of who Jesus is. Until we meet again, much love.